Hinduism. A Fellowship of Faiths. 1. The Age of the World. In Hindu societies, among those who follow Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, it is believed that man appeared on the world scene at an inconceivably remote point of time. The Hindus consider the world as part of a beginningless and endless process which follows fixed cycles known as days of Brahma. Each day of Brahma lasts about four and a half billion years. Adherents of Jainism, an ascetic offshoot of Hinduism, believe that their founder, the first of 24, appeared 100 trillion, 100,000 million, pal years ago. And if one should ask what period of time is represented by a palia, the answer would be that a palia is the length of time that it would take to empty a well one mile square and one mile deep, full of fine hair, if one hair is taken out every hundred years. This is their allegorical way of saying that they believe the world always existed and always will exist. This view is a basic difference between the Judeo-Christian Islamic religions and the Hindu religions. The first three believe the entire universe was created about 6,000 years ago, and the latter believe that the world has always existed though in a constant, it gradual, state of transformation. In what they refer to as the Night of Brahma, the world is in a state of chaos and dissolution, and in the day of Brahma it is being reformed or recreated. And one day and night of Brahma lasts about four and a half billion years. Another basic difference between the Judeo-Christian Islamic and the Hindu beliefs concerns the universe. The first group believe that the world was created, and someday in the unknown future it will end. The Hindus believe that the world always was and always will be. It will change, but it will never end. The historic period of man, as we now know, is minute as compared with the prehistoric period, for while the historic period is measured in centuries, and they are as yet few, the prehistoric period is measured in millennia, and they are very many. All human institutions of the comparatively brief historic period are deeply rooted in the incalculably long prehistoric period. All we know and believe has its origin in primitive myths and myth-making, in animism and polytheism, in idolatry and fetishism, and in every conceivable, what we now call, superstition. But we should always remember that the superstitions were part of the religions, and were no less sacred to the people who believed them than our beliefs and creeds to us. Max Miller, the great 19th century German Orientalist and translator of the sacred books of the East, once wrote, there never was a false god, nor was there really ever a false religion, unless you call a child a false man. 2. The Hindu Triad. India has been the stage of intense religious activity for a number of millennia. And the religion of India, Hinduism, has shown an extraordinary tolerance to other faiths which have been brought into the country. It therefore absorbed influences from without as well as evolved from within. And it passed through a number of stages, or periods, which are reflected in the sacred books. Some Hindu scholars regard Hinduism as a fellowship of faiths. Hinduism has no founder, and it has no fixed creed but it does have a number of beliefs which are held by most, if not all, Hindus. The central belief of Hinduism is that there is one universal spirit, or eternal essence, without beginning or end, called Brahman, which means, the world soul. This world soul is the three-in-one God, called the Trimu Tree. He is called the three-in-one God because they believe Brahman is Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. These are not separate one from the other, even though they are different, but are different aspects or manifestations of the same divine unity. In addition to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, there are a great many other attributes of the triad which have been symbolized, and are called gods. But in Hinduism, 
The word God does not carry the same meaning as it does in other religions. And they do not claim that Brahman loves or hates, compensates or punishes, or has any other anthropomorphic characteristics. Hindus believe that the triad which evolved from the world's soul are continually creating and evolving and changing the world. At the end of a cycle, called a day of Brahma, Shiva destroys the old world, Brahma creates a new one. And Vishnu appears on earth in different human forms, or incarnations, to preserve the world and to guide and enlighten man. 3. The Soul's Garment Man is considered as not outside the world's soul but as part of it. Man consists of body and soul. The body is like an outer robe that one puts away when outworn. The soul endures forever the body is ruled by passion and desires and meaningless ambitions. But the soul is ruled by serenity and the tranquil search for truth. The wise in heart mourn not for those who live, nor for those who die so begins the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord's Song, of the great Hindu epic called the Mahabharata. The wise in heart try to live their temporal lives not controlled by their physical desires or swayed by the deception of their senses, but in calm, one must not be moved by either joy or sorrow, but submit to fate. If one wishes to attain truth and understand the ultimate nature of reality, the wise in heart are cautioned to scorn those who follow virtue for its reward. Doing the right thing is its own reward. If any other rewards are expected, the acts are no longer right. And each right act must be preceded by right thinking, the right thinking must be preceded by tranquility. And tranquility, according to the Bhagavad Gita, comes to him who deals with objects of the senses not loving and not hating, making them serve his free soul, which remains serenely lord. Hinduism is the only religion that believes in a caste system. Brahma, so Hinduism teaches, created the first man. Named Manu, out of Manu's head came the best and holiest people. They were called Brahmin. Out of Manu's hands came the rulers and warriors they were called Kshatriyas. Out of Manu's thighs came the craftsmen of the world, called Vaisyas and out of Manu's feet mine the rest of the people, called Sudras. Thus Brahma the Creator determined that there should be four different castes of people. The Brahmins, who belong to the highest caste, are the prince and philosophers, dedicated to the study of the sacred books, and they are supported by the state or the other castes. Brahmins are vegetarians, bathe twice daily in flowing water, and wear the sacred thread that is a symbol of their status. All other castes must do honor to them and even the royal or ruling family must show them the greatest respect. Those who belong to the Kshatriyas engage in all manner of governmental and legal activities and professions. They have prescribed religious duties to perform, but owe respect to the Brahmin. This caste represents the upper middle class of Indian society. The Vaisyas minister to the material needs of their fellow countrymen. They are the merchants, farmers and industrialists. While they are below the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, they are above the rest of the population in distinction and religious privileges. The duty or fate of the Sudras is to serve the rest of the people as workmen, artisans, farm laborers, servants and gardeners. They are not permitted to study the Vedas, the sacred books of Hinduism, and are excluded from many religious duties or participation in rituals. In time the caste system became divided and subdivided into many other castes within each caste until there were thousands of castes in India and no member of a lower caste could rise to a position within one considered higher or even eat or drink with a member of a higher caste. He could not many into a caste higher than his own. Nor could he worship within the same temple, or be buried in the same burial ground. Soon there appeared in India, 
people who did not belong to even the lowest of the thousands of castes. They were pariahs and outcasts of their society, and they mule to be known as untouchables because contact with them was supposed to pollute and degrade any caste members. Though no one knows precisely the origin of the outcasts, it is believed that they were the offspring of intermarriage, forbidden between the castes, or the children of illicit unions. This large casteless class serve as butchers and as grave diggers, and do other tasks considered degrading. The outcasts mused many uprisings in India during the early part of the 20th century. Mahatma Gandhi was one of the leaders who devoted much of his time and energy toward restoring a caste status to these people. He also led a strong movement for the abolition of tastes. But since the caste system is not only condoned but prescribed by the laws of Manu, it continues to exist in the social order of the Hindus. 5. From good must come good. Hinduism believes in the law of the deed, called karma. This law teaches, from good must come good, and from evil, evil. Every thought and every act is either good or bad. Each is compensated or punished accordingly, if not immediately, then in a subsequent incarnation. What we think and what we do determine inexorably what we are or are going to be. This is karma. What we are now is the result of our thoughts and deeds in past incarnations, and what we think or do in our lives will determine what we will be like in the next incarnation. Suicide is obviously no escape. One may kill the body but not the soul. The only solution is to think and act in a way that will eventually accrue enough merit to compensate in a future rebirth. The end of birth is death and the end of death is birth, this is ordained. So it is written in the Bhagavad Gita. The body of man is like a garment. When it becomes outworn through age or illness, the soul leaves it and is reincarnated in the body of a newborn baby. The belief in a life hereafter is held by other religions. Even reincarnation, in the way it is interpreted in Hinduism, appears in other living religions. But reincarnation as a continuous process, combined with the karmic law, so that as soon as an individual dies he is reborn, and either punished for all the evil he has done, or rewarded for all the good he has done this is peculiar to the religion of Hinduism. Mahatma Gandhi, in a letter to one of his disciples, wrote, the more I observe and study things, the more convinced I become that sorrow over separation and death is perhaps the greatest delusion. To realize that it is a delusion is to become free. There is no death, no separation of the substance. And yet the tragedy of it is that though we love friends for the substance we recognize in them, we deplore the destruction of the insubstantial that covers the substance for the time being. Whereas real friendship should be used to reach the whole through the fragment. You seem to have got. What you say about rebirth is sound. It is nature's kindness that we do not remember past births. Where is the good either of knowing in detail the numberless births we have gone through? Life would be a burden if we carried such a tremendous load of memories. A wise man deliberately forgets many things, even as a lawyer forgets the cases and their details as soon as they are disposed of. Yes, death is but a sleep and a forgetting. Mother is slowly going. It will be well if the end comes soon. It is better to leave a body one has outgrown. To wish to see the dearest ones as long as possible in the flesh is a selfish desire and it comes out of weakness or want of faith in the survival of the soul after the dissolution of the body. The form ever changes, ever perishes, the informing spirit neither changes nor perishes. True love consists in transferring itself from the body to the dweller within and then necessarily realizing the oneness of all life inhabiting numberless bodies. Both birth and death are great mysteries. If death is not a prelude to another life, 
the intermediate period is a cruel mockery. 6. The King and Panto Nagasena. The difficult concept of reincarnation is presented in the following story form, one of many used in Hindu literature. To illustrate the beliefs of Hinduism, the king said, Panto Nagasena, does rebirth take place without anything transmigrating, passing over? Yes, your majesty. Rebirth takes place without anything transmigrating. How, Panto Nagasena, does rebirth take place without anything transmigrating? Give an illustration. Suppose, your majesty, a man were to light a light from another light, pray, would the one light have passed over? Transmigrated, to the other light? No, verily, Panto. In exactly the same way, your majesty, does rebirth take place without anything transmigrating? Give another illustration. Do you remember, your majesty, having learnt, when you were a boy, some verse or other from your professor of poetry? Yes, Panto. Pray, your majesty, did the verse pass over, transmigrate, to you from your teacher? No, verily, Panto. In exactly the same way, your majesty, does rebirth take place without anything transmigrating? Panto Nagasena, said the king, what is it that is born into the next existence? Your majesty, said the elder, it is name and form that is born into the next existence. 7. The Yogas. If the soul of man is deathless and is reincarnated generation after generation, carrying forward compensation or punishment, according to the karmic law, then what ultimate promise is there for the individual soul that has led the good life? What release awaits him from the burden of the cycle of reincarnation? Hinduism believes that individual souls, which are like sparks of the eternal essence, when purified by good, are finally released from the bondage of reincarnation in the flesh. And the soul is joined with the world soul forever. This state is called Nirvana. And it is the belief of Hinduism that as an aid in reaching Nirvana, there are certain disciplines, known as yogas. These disciplines are of great antiquity, and are mentioned in the Vedas, the sacred books of this religion. The first discipline of yoga is prolonged immobility and controlled breathing. The physical disciplines are necessary to gain complete concentration for the effort to identify with the Absolute, with the Brahman. There are various kinds of yoga, and various stages of development in all of them. After complete physical control, comes control of the emotions, and moral purity, which makes possible total concentration. There is also the law of moral order, Dharma, according to Hinduism, which each individual must discover for himself. For each race, each caste, each family group has its Dharma. They are not the same. But they lead to the same ultimate objective, reunion with the world soul. 8. The Sacred Vedas. All Hindus have a deep reverence for the eldest of their sacred books, the Vedas, books of knowledge. The four Vedic books are vast collections of hymns to a number of gods, prayers that accompany sacrifices, chants to be sung to traditional melodies, spells and incantations, beliefs for the rich and beliefs for the poor, and devotional prayers. The most ancient and best known of the Vedas is the Rigveda, a collection of about 1,200 hymns addressed to various nature gods, though chiefly to Indra, god of storms and winds, and Angi, god of fire. One of these hymns is of particular interest, for it describes creation, and affords comparison with the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible. This hymn from the Rigveda was translated by Ralph T. Griffith, who was president of Banaras College in India over a century ago. 9. Creation Hymn Then was not non-existent nor existent, there was no realm of air, no sky beyond it. What covered in, and where and what gave shelter? 
Was water there, unfathomed depth of water? Death was not then, not was there aught immortal, no sign was there, the days and nights divider. That one thing, breathless, breathed by its own nature, apart from it was nothing whatsoever. Darkness there was, at first concealed in darkness this all was indiscriminated chaos. All that existed then was void and formless, by the great power of warmth was born that unit. Thereafter rose desire in the beginning desire, the primal seed and germ of spirit. Sages who searched with their heart's thought discovered the existence kinship in the non-existent. Transversely was their severing line extended, what was above it then, and what below it? There were begetters, there were mighty forces, free action here and energy up yonder. Who verily knows and who can here declare it, whence it was born and whence comes this creation? The gods are later than this world's production. Who knows then whence it first came into being? He, the first origin of this creation, whether he formed it all or did not form it, whose eye controls this world in highest heaven, he verily knows it, or perhaps he knows not. To the Vedas have been added many tomes of commentaries, called Upanishads, which attempt to explain the ultimate nature of reality. The original Vedas and their numerous commentaries have produced a multitude of sects, each breaking off because of their disagreement on interpretations of some of the articles of faith or certain rituals followed in performing their devotion. In the 6th century BC, two great Hindu dissenters arose who, as we shall see later, became the founders of two religions and challenged some of the teachings of the Vedas. But those who remained within the fold of Hinduism also adapted themselves to changing times and reinterpreted their beliefs to correspond to new conditions of life. The Vedas, however, continue to exert a great influence on the Hindus. Many of the sacrifices, traditions, and rituals were abandoned, displaced, or modified, but the essential beliefs as given in the Vedas continue to exert a strong hold on the followers of Hinduism. The sacred books of Hinduism are more numerous than those of any other religion. In addition to the canonical works, such as the Vedas, the Brahmanas, commentaries on the Vedas, and the Upanishads, which are mystic speculations, there are a number of apocryphal works held in high esteem and which, today, are better known and exert a greater influence upon Hindus than the canonical works, known principally to theologians and scholars. 10. Two great epics. Two great and very long poems in particular have left their mark on the soul of every Hindu. One of these epics is the Ramayana, which means the adventures of Rama. It tells the story of Vishnu the Preserver, who appeared in his seventh incarnation as Prince Rama, son of King Dasharatha, ruler of the children of the sun. Rama's mission on earth was to save mankind from evil, represented by the ruler of the giants, King Ravan. This epic is part of the Hindu scriptures and has been kept fresh in the hearts of many generations of Hindus through an annual ten-day pageant. The pageant stresses the victories of Rama, who lived, according to tradition, a million and three hundred thousand years ago. Actually the ten-day holiday, called Durga Puya, is dedicated to the worship of the Divine Mother. But two hours of each of the Durga Puja are devoted to a dramatic reading of the Ramayana, this ends with the celebrants burning King Ravan in effigy. More influential in Hinduism is the much longer epic, called Mahabharata, the Great Brothers. In this epic Vishnu, in his incarnation as Krishna, expounds his doctrines in a section known as the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord's Song. The perfect warrior in the epic, Arjuna, appeals to Krishna on the eve of a great battle. Arjuna is not certain he can distinguish the right from the wrong course of action. He pleads, How can I, in the battle, shoot with shafts on Bhishma, or on Drona, O, oh, thou chief? Both worshipful, both honorable men? 
Better to live on beggar's bread with those we love alive, than taste their blood in rich feasts spread, and guiltily survive. Ah! Were it worse, who knows? To be victor or vanquished here, when those confront us angrily, whose death leaves living drear? In pity lost, by doubtings tossed, my thoughts, distracted, turn to thee, the guide I reverence most, that I may counsel learn. Krishna's long and involved answers to relieve Arjuna's distress masterfully delineate the philosophical and theological principles of Hinduism. You grieve where no grief should be. You speak words lacking wisdom. For the wise in heart, mourn not for those that live, nor those that die. Nor I, nor you, nor any one of these. Ever was not, nor ever will not be. Forever and forever afterwards. All, that does live, lives always. To man's frame. As there come infancy and youth and age, so come the raisings up and layings down of other and still other life abodes, which the wise know and fear not. This that irks your sense life, thrilling to the elements, bringing you heat and cold, sorrows and joys, is brief and mutable. Bear with it, Prince as the wise bear, the soul which is not moved, the soul that with a strong and constant calm, takes sorrow and takes joy indifferently, lives in the life undying, that which is, can never cease to be, that which is not will not exist. To see this truth of both is theirs who part essence from accident, substance from shadow, indestructible. Learn. The life is, spreading life through all. It cannot anywhere, by any means, be anywise diminished, stayed or changed. End and beginning are dreams. Birthless and deathless and changeless remains the spirit forever. Death has not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seems. Know me, as I am, the very truth. Earth water, flame, air, ether, life, and mind, and individuality, those eight, make up the showing of me, manifest. All these hang on me, as hangs a row of pearls upon its string. I am the fresh taste of the water, I, the silver of the moon, the gold of the sun, the word of worship in the Veda, the thrill that passes in the ether, and the strength of man's shed seed. I am the good sweet smell of the moistened earth, I am the fire's red light, the vital air moving in all which moves, the holiness of hallowed souls, the root undying, whence has sprung whatever is, the wisdom of the wise, the intellect zero f the informed, the greatness of the great, the splendor of the splendid, I am the sacrifice. I am the prayer. I am the funeral cake set for the dead. I am the healing herb. I am the ghee. The mantra, and the flame, and that which burns. I am, of all this boundless universe. The father, mother, ancestor, and God. The way, the fosterer, the lord, the judge. The witness, the abode the refuge house, the friend, the fountain and the sea of life, which sends and swallows up treasure of world, and treasure chamber, seed and seed, sewer, whence endless harvests spring, sun's heat is mine, heaven's rain is mine to grant or to withhold, death am I, and immortal life I am, Arjuna, Sat and asat, visible life, and life invisible. Then Arjuna asks, Lord, of the men who serve you, true in heart, as God revealed, and of the men who serve, worshipping you unrevealed, unbodied, 
far. Which take the better way of faith and life? And Krishna answers, Who hates not? Of all which lives, living himself benign. Compassionate, from arrogance exempt. Exempt from love of self, unchangeable. By good or ill, patient, contented, firm. In faith, mastering himself, true to his word. Seeking me, heart and soul, vowed unto me. That man I love. Who to the friend and foe. Keeping an equal heart, with equal mind. Bears shame and glory, with an equal peace. Takes heat and cold, pleasure and pain, abides. Quit of desires, hears praise or calumny. In passionless restraint, unmoved by each. Linked by no ties to earth, steadfast to me. That man I love. This great poetic work has won readers the world over. So sacred is the Mahabharata considered by the Hindus. That they believe reading it destroys all sin and creates. Virtue. And the statement is made at the very opening of. The Mahabharata, that reciting a single stanza is enough. To wipe away much evil. 11. What Hinduism believes. Just as the attributes of the Hindu triad multiplied until there were millions of them, and the castes divided and subdivided from the original four to a very large number, so also has this extremely old religion given rise to many sects. There are sects who worship Vishnu as the god of space and time. There are sects who worship Shiva, or Lord Shiva, as a god of song and healing. There are sects who worship Durga, the Divine Mother, Goddess of Motherhood. And there are many others, but all the various sects believe in. Brahman, the Eternal Trimutri, or three in, one God. Brahma, the Creator, Vishnu, the Preserver, and Shiva, the Destroyer. Submission to fate, since man is not outside, but part of Brahman. The caste system, determined by the laws of Manu. The law of karma, that from good must come good, and from evil must come evil. Reincarnation, as a chain of rebirths in which each soul, through virtuous living, can rise to a higher state. Nirvana, the final stage reached upon the emancipation of the soul from the chain of rebirths. Yogas, the disciplines which enable the individual to control the body and the emotions, and Dharma, the law of moral order, which CAD, individual, must find and follow to reach Nirvana. 12. Sayings from the Bhagavad Gita. The precepts which teach the basic beliefs of Hinduism are given throughout the voluminous literature of the Vedas, the sacred books of knowledge, the Brahmamas, the commentaries on the Vedas, the Upanishads, mystic speculations, the Hittapadza, the Book of Good Counsel, and, particularly, the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the great epic, the Mahabharata. The soul which is not moved, that takes sorrow and takes joy indifferently, lives in the life undying. Birthless and deathless and changeless remains the spirit, dead though the house of it seems. As one lays away a worn-out robe and takes a new one, so the spirit puts by its garment of flesh and passes to inherit a new one. If you hear that the man newly dead is like the man newly born, will you weep? The end of birth is death, the end of death is birth, this is ordained. Find the reward of doing right, in right. Make your acts your piety. Scorn those who follow virtue for her gifts. Because they seek no gain, the right-hearted rise more certainly from the bands of body, step by step, to the highest bliss. In sorrows not dejected, in joys not overjoyed, outside the stress of passion, fear and anger, steadfastly calm in lofty contemplation, such a one is the wise man. 
He who is wise draws away his five frail senses from the world which assails them, as the tortoise draws its feet beneath the safety of its shell. Four sorts of mortals know me, he who weeps, the man who yearns to know, he who toils to help and he who sits certain of me, enlightened. Higher, deeper, innermost, abides another life, not like the life of the senses, escaping sight, unchanging. This endures when all created things have passed away. Whoever offers me in faith and love a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or water poured forth, that offering made lovingly. With pious will, I accept. Those who worship me with love, I love, they are in me, and I in them. Be certain that none can perish, trusting me. You who have come into this sorrowful and fleeting world, set your faith fast on me. Make me your supreme joy, and to my rest your spirits shall be guided. Near renunciation, very near, dwells eternal peace. He who troubles not his kind, and is not troubled by them, free of wrath, living too high for gladness, grief or firth at man I love, know that nature and the spirit both have no beginning. He sees indeed who sees in all alike the living, lordly soul, supreme, imperishable amid the perishing. Ignorance, begot of darkness, blinding mortal men, binds down their souls to sloth and stupor. Passion binds by toilsome strain, but ignorance, which shuts out the beams of wisdom, binds the soul to sloth. The fruit of lust underscore par 1n1s and toil. The fruit of ignorance is deeper darkness. Those of little wit, dark-minded, give themselves to evil deeds. Ensnared in nooses of a hundred idle hopes, slaves of passion and anger by wealth with their base deeds to glut hot appetites. The doors of hell are threefold, through which men to ruin pass, the door of lust, the door of wrath, the door of avarice. The faith of each believer conforms itself to what he truly is. Purity, rectitude and no injury to any helpless thing's virtues, born of his nature, are serenity, self-mastery, religion, purity, patience, uprightness, learning, and to know the truth of things which be. A Kshatriya's task, worn with his nature, is to till the ground, tend cattle, venture trade. A Sudra's state, suiting his nature, is to minister.